gets me through most meetings that Good morning. My name is Craig Stenning, Senior Vice President for Occupational Health for FedCap. And it's my pleasure to welcome you this morning to our thought-provoking solution series. For those of you who may be with us for the first time, FedCap, a nonprofit founded in 1935, develops innovative, creative, and sustainable solutions that help people surmount barriers, work towards economic independence, and affect change in their families and our communities. FedCap Solution Series, one of our most innovative programs, gathers employers, government leaders, nonprofits, and advocates to analyze the barriers between Americans and economic independence, and develops informed and actionable plans to break through these barriers. Past solution series have included a conversation with Patrick Kennedy on mental health issues, immigration and its impact on business, the cost and benefits of minimum wage increases, a path for self-sufficiency for youth transitioning out of foster care, connecting veterans and formerly incarcerated to jobs, among several other topics. Today's discussion is entitled, Addressing Employee Mental Health and Addiction, Improving Your Business Bottom Line. No issue confronting America today has captured our attention more than the crisis involving heroin use, fentanyl overdoses, prescription drug misuse, and the relationship to mental illness. But lost in many of these discussions is the downward spiral of the individual from employed to a troubled worker to unemployed and then federal benefits. Every state is dealing with this crisis. One of our mantras at FedCap is work completes treatment. But what happens when addiction and mental illness begin to surface in the workplace? How do we change a culture of fear and stigma into one of acceptance, support, and encouragement for employees who struggle with mental illness and or substance use disorders? How do we convince people that treatment works and recovery is possible? With 23 and a half million people suffering with substance abuse disorders, costing employees 276 billion, $276 billion a year. It's critical that we address this issue. Just yesterday, the White House announced a new initiative to elevate this issue. And last week, the U.S. Senate passed the first bipartisan supported bill this year in Congress to deal with this issue called the Comprehensive Addiction and Recovery Act. This is the importance of today's solution series. Before introducing our moderator, Lori Lutz, I want to thank each of you for attending and participating in this discussion. Our dynamic panel will be introduced by Lori, but I certainly want to thank them for their involvement and their contributions. We certainly appreciate Mutual of America for allowing us to use this incredible space. None of this obviously would occur without an incredible board of directors for FedCap, many of whom are with us today and in the back of the room. Uh, our board chair, I've gotten to know uh, the chair over the past uh, couple of years, and he's an amazing individual who really gets it, as we say, Mark O'Donoghue. And I want to thank all of my colleagues at FedCap for your contribution and commitment each and every day to the lives of the individuals that we serve. Our facilitator, Laurie Lutz, is FedCap's Chief Strategy Officer, overseeing an amazing number of innovative programs, including the Solution Series. Prior to joining FedCap, Lori was a national consultant, specializing in enhancing the quality of social services with a specialty in foster care. Her past professional experience included serving as Director of Children, Youth, and Families in another state and several other government positions. 
Her graduate degree is in public policy administration, and her insightful and probing style allows our solution series to succeed. Lori. Thank you. Good morning. We're so lucky to have Craig as our Senior Vice President for Occupational Health. Wow, look at this room. It is packed to the gills, I think they say. And I understand why when you hear our panelists, I think you will be really pleased you made the effort to get here this morning and I'm excited to introduce them. I'm gonna start with Brooke. Um, Brooke Wilson is, and I'm going to read her title because She'll talk about why Aetna has made a shift in what they call their EAP program. Brooke is the head of work-life services for resources for living. And her, she's basically tipped Aetna's EAP program upside down. And I think you'll see that as you start to talk and listen to her. In her role, she oversees strategic product development of this work-life program. She oversees um, key strategic initiatives, including, and I think this is very germane, the mental health first aid initiative and the campaign to change direction. She oversees corporate training. She oversees corporate communications. She's been with Aetna since 2009, but brings with her um, experience today and brought to Aetna 20 years of experience in helping mobilize the way people think about how we engage employees and provide employee assistance programs. So, Brooke, thank you so much for being here today. You can clap. That would be perfectly good. <laughs> Next, I want to introduce Matt Sisk. Matt has been through a journey, and Matt will talk about his journey with a kind of courage that only someone who's gone through the mill and come out on the other side really can. Mac currently serves as the Massachusetts Governor Charlie Baker Administrator's Deputy Commission, Commissioner of the Department of Conservation and Recreation. He is the one that makes the parks and parkways beautiful throughout um, Massachusetts. Matt joined the Baker administration after working in the U.S. Small Business Administration, where he worked since 2009. Matt has a history of pretty impressive government positions. He held the role as senior advisor under the U.S. General Services Administration, appointed by President Bush, as well as the director of board and commission appointments for Massachusetts Governor Jane Swift. Can you help me join and thank Matt for being here? And next and last, we have Jim Salzano. I think you will be delighted once Jim starts to talk, because you'll hear his passion and the, his real thoughtful approach to the topic that we're discussing today. Jim is the CEO of Easy Spirit Shoes, which is a division of Nine West Holdings. Prior to that, Jim served as a president of Clark's America and a member of Clark's global executive leadership team. He joined Clark in 1995. At that time, they had about $40 million in revenue. When Jim left, they had $1.1 billion in revenue just in North America. At Clark's, he co-founded the First Step program, which gives internships opportunities to people with disabilities, which is near and dear to our heart. In 2010, Jim was asked by, um, at that time, Governor Deval Patrick to really spearhead a report outlining recommendations for establishing a public-private partnership that it would employ people with a diverse array of barriers. So, again, if you can join me in welcoming our panel. So we're, um, as Craig um, highlighted, this is an interesting time in America, probably across the country, for people stricken with mental illness and addiction. The numbers are staggering, and we'll allude to a few of those as we um, have our conversation this morning. But one thing we know is preserving an ab a person's ability to work, to stay employed, is foundational to their long-term recovery. And so how do you do that when you are in an environment where stigma is as pervasive as it is today around mental illness and around addiction? And it's interesting, the ignorance, if I can use that language, around mental illness and addiction in some ways starts within ourselves. 
So here I am, let's say I'm an individual who struggles with depression or even bipolar conditions, and my attitude, the, the message that I give to myself, that little voice keeps saying, suck it up, you can do it, suck it up. But pretty soon I can't suck it up anymore. Pretty soon I'm no longer able to even fake it. And so you start to see the decrease in productivity, increase in called in sick days, and eventually you start to see that I apply for some form of disability. In fact, the co-occurring condition of mental illness and addiction is the number one rationale or reason for disability claims in the United States. As employers, we can't ignore that. That's a heart, um, it's kind of the data that causes us to stand up and say we've got to do something about this and address this issue in a different way. I thought it was very interesting that Covey and Phelps put out an article recently that said that of the 75 drivers of employee engagement that translates directly into higher productivity, the one that employees cited as the most important was that they knew their senior management cared about their overall well-being. That's the number one engagement. So with that, I'm going to turn to you, Jim, because when you and I spoke, and he is such a delightful person to speak to, you provided a way of thinking about this issue of stigma and employee engagement um, that I don't think I'd ever heard or contemplated. Could you talk about that? You must have caught me on a good day. I'm sure I didn't. No, I enjoyed the conversation. Um, and I drew on the experience, um, as I was telling you stories, uh, when I was with a great team of people at Clark's uh, for 18 years. And, I, you know, I, can you hear me okay? I'll speak up. Can you hear me back there now? All right, I'll speak up. We, we, so we just talked about uh, this, this idea of uh, leadership with a sense of humanity. And, and it's very basic to me that I simply like to treat people like I'd like to be treated if I was in that kind of situation. And uh, we talked about disability and the work that we did at Clark's together. And I got very involved with um, the uh, disability community. And this idea of stigma, when we reached out to the businesses in Massachusetts, the number one issue with employing people with disabilities, and, and, and I think I even qualified that to say it wasn't that we were out to provide employment for people with disabilities. What I found was they weren't even getting access to the interview because there was this enormous stigma that created a, a, a real distortion about what people were, um, this won't work with me. I, I use my hands too much, so if I can keep the lavalier going. Um, so the idea of a disability really struck me as something odd, that someone drew a line and, and on this side was disability and on this side was ability, and I think we all have some form of um, idiosyncrasy that we bring to work, and that's really part of the great thing about a great workforce. So creating a place where people felt comfortable with vulnerability was really important. And, and the way we talked about doing that was this idea of building trust, which is key in any relationship that you have in life, any good relationship. And, and um, we, we just, you know, and trust isn't something you can say exists. You have to demonstrate it. You have to demonstrate it through your actions. And, and, and basically, the way I would coin it is that I would say to people, you know, if, if something comes up, you'd be surprised what we say yes to. And, and, we didn't manage by policy. You can't manage people by policy. Everybody is different. And, and we, we, we benefited from the great diversity that we had in our workforce. And what we found with the work that we did with people with disabilities was that we had been focusing too much on differences and not enough on the similarities. And what people brought to work was really inside them and how they walked, looked, talked, age, gender. It didn't really matter. It was what was inside people that drove them. And when you create this culture that I'm referring to, um, you, you, magic happens. People start to think about the place as something precious in their life. You're going to talk about work-life balance. I kind of look at it as just life, one big, one big part of your life. And people start to think about the place when they don't really get paid to think about it, and magic things happen. When you say they, um, they get to a place where they um, let's say they're home or whatever they're doing, and they're not being paid to think about it, but they start to think about it, and that generates innovation. Talk a little bit about more about that, Jim. Well, it's you know it can happen anywhere. I you know I I, I 
I'll come to work on Monday and somebody will, will, it's a great sign when somebody leads off with a comment like, you know, I was out shopping and I saw this and I thought, well, maybe we can adapt that to something we're doing at Easy Spirit or it gave us a great idea to try something in one of our stores. And, and I, it just, again, when, when people find a place to go to during the day, and that's, that's one step beyond saying you have a job, and, and, and all of a sudden this place becomes an extension of their life, it's just something that they naturally start to think about. And, and, they'll, and they'll see things going on in their life, or they'll be, they'll be watching something on television, and an idea will pop up. I get a text message, or I'll get an email over the weekend. And, and those are really good signs that you're cultivating something really healthy among a team. You know, and I think you know, the way I looked at it, and the way I look at it, and, and it's just a style, is that my obligation is to serve everybody in the organization. You know, I had a conversation with our retail group the other day to say the people on the selling floor, and this is why the microphone won't work, could you imagine me using it? <laughs> The people on the selling floor really are at the top of our org chart. And it's my obligation to make sure they have everything they need, including a comfortable environment to share when they're not having a great day or there's something that they need us to step in and help with. And you know, I think too often we, we, we are conditioned in a work environment to reject people when they need us most because we're uncomfortable being vulnerable ourselves and we haven't built the trust, and we haven't built the environment to have a conversation about how we can help. I can't fix everything, but I can definitely reach out to people that can. And, and it makes me comfortable to sit there and embrace people when they, meet us uh, when they need us most. I just want to say one more thing about this before you cut me off, <laughs> is that it's an enormous responsibility when somebody chooses to join your organization. Um, and and I treat it as an honor that somebody is employing us to spend their time during the day. And that's a huge obligation. And I think when you, when you, when you think about it that way, it creates a thoughtful beginning to a great relationship. And you're very careful, too, about who you hire. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. You're welcome. Matt, so um, you are um, gracious enough to share with us your journey. And it's had its fits and starts, and obviously you've come through to the other side. I wonder if you'd be willing to talk a little bit about your journey and, and maybe really address this issue of stigma and how it stopped you in many ways from getting the help you needed. Yeah, I'd be glad to. Um, first of all, let me uh, thank uh, FedCap, um, and you, Lori, my fellow panelists, and uh, Andrea Mitch, who invited me here today. Um, I'm uh, glad to speak to you about this stuff. It, it certainly is a journey. Um, <clears throat> my sobriety date is 7-30-2008. Uh, uh, it was at that time uh, that I had my last drink. Um, and this journey that you talk about, and as it relates to stigma, I guess one of the main things you have to understand about addiction um, is that, in, in my opinion anyway, it is a fear-based disease. So right away, fear and stigma go right along with each other. Um, and I think that as far as an employee, so you know, I, I've had the unique experience to be on both sides of the desk, if you will. Somebody who's had to face the problem uh, with an employer and somebody who has faced it as, um, I'm sorry, as an employee and somebody who has had to face it as an employer. Um, at the time when I got sober, I was, uh, had uh, suffered through a second DUI. Um, so I had to go back and face my boss. Now I had had a first one uh, along the way. And, you know, the first one, you know, I think w you can kind of write it off, right? Y yourself, well, I'm full of excuses, right? You know, this certainly isn't a problem. You know, I just happened to get pulled over. I wasn't doing anything wrong. How dare he pull me over, right? Um, you know, the second one becomes problematic, you know, and, and you, you have to start to deal with it. Now, I don't think anyone who's dealt with addiction on a personal level, you know, I didn't, I didn't come out of the womb wanting to uh, be an alcoholic. Uh, you know, I didn't say, gee, I can't wait to sit in an AA meeting. This is just something I, I'm really looking forward to. Um, and, you know, the funny thing is, is dealing with the stigma, you know, I'll just tell you about the first day that I decided to do something about my problem. I was coming back from Maine where, where I had uh, got arrested, and I was on my way back. And at, at this point in your life, you know, alcoholism is a, and, and addiction is a disease of progression. 
okay? Things start out at a certain level, uh, you know, your, your college drinking or whatever it is, and, and it gets worse. And you start doing things that you promised yourself you would never do. Or you start, uh, you know, you start hiding booze. Or, for example, you know, nips. You know, uh, I, I always tell this story. You know, I used to walk into college, I'd see these big, you know, the liquor store in Switzerland, this big wall of, of nips. I said, there can't be that many people getting on an airplane today. You know, there's just no way. But, you know, nips, nips are for people who, who probably have a little problem with drinking because you can hide it. You know, and you start, it's a disease of progression. You start to do things that you promised yourself you wouldn't do or you would look at other people and say, why do they do that? Well, as you go through this battle, you start to realize what that's all about. You know, so that first day I got home, you know, I called the only friend of mine who I knew. I had to talk to my boss. I had to do something about this. Now, I'm be very frank with all of you. I had no intentions of getting sober at the time. But I, it was, I had to do something. I could not walk through that front door and face my wife, now ex-wife, um, and, and face my family. Because it, you've gone, you know, they say that recovery is the last house on the block that you're going to go to. Because nobody else wants you in your life when you're at this point, pretty much. So I, you know, I called his friend, he says, I'll meet you in, I'm from a, a suburb of Boston, about 14 miles south called Braintree. And I uh, called him, he says, I'll meet you at, you know, I'll see you at a, a meeting in Braintree. And I said, I'm not going to a meeting in Braintree. You know, I, I'm not gonna do that. And why is that? Because it's fear, it's stigma. So I met him in Boston, you know, because everyone in Braintree, my hometown, didn't know I was a drunk, right? You know, they've only known me my whole life. Um, you know, so, the, the, but these are the things that you've got to go through, and, the, you know, that's just one part of it. There's, there's also the employee aspect of it, and, and what help is associated with you. You have to be able to create an atmosphere where the employee, I think, is willing to accept what you say, but, you know, it, keeping in mind that this is, is based in fear, you know, the, the stigma is never really going to be gone. So they have to feel comfortable about it. You know, they have to be able to, to know that you're not going to talk about it. And that starts long before that employee ever comes. You know, if you're standing around the, the bubbler and, you know, you're chit-chatting about how Bob's always late and he stinks of booze this morning and blah, 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 blah. Well, the other person who's sitting next to you may also have that same problem. So when you've got to deal with it, because it is a disease of progression, it may not be bad now, it may be bad in five years. When you've got to deal with that other guy standing around the bubbler that you were talking to about Bob, he's going to be less likely to come to you for help. So you're both, thanks so much, Matt. So you're both starting to tee up on the culture and the way in which a culture is created and permeates an organization that actually allows for the kind of engagement that's required for people who have issues of addiction and mental illness to come forward. And I think the reason we wanted to start laying that kind of a foundation is because it is about 72% more expensive by every um, article I read to replace an employee than it is to engage and save, if you want to use that language, an employee. But Brooke, there's this lexicon in um, HR today called presenteeism. And it's, um, I, I used to hear something similar to this when I was involved in the military. It was called retired while on active duty. And basically what it means is that you're the working wounded. You um, have an issue and you come to work, but your productivity is really abysmal. And that lack of being present um, impacts not only your own work, but the, the work of those around you. And I was intrigued to know that in 2013 research of all EAP programs, that among all productivity losses, 81% is due to presenteeism. And that's directly related to mental health and substance use disorders in the workplace. So I wonder, Brooke, if you could start to um, dive us into are employees seeing this increase? And if so, what are you seeing in terms of how they're managing it? Are employers seeing this increase? 
Yep, and, and, and they are. And businesses hire us specifically to try to impact presenteeism and absenteeism in the workplace. So particularly with substance abuse and mental health issues, you know, it's, I, I kind of think of it like uh, maybe you have a, a, another physical chronic condition or a broken arm. When you get to work, you can't leave that at the door. So you're dealing with that while you're sitting at your desk. Um, but at the same time, you, every, you have the issues that everybody else has too. So those are caregiving issues. Who's gonna pick up the kids? Maybe you're caring for a parent, um, picking up groceries later. All these things are, are what you're trying to figure out how to solve while you're on the job as well. So, um, oh, and I'll add to that too, that sometimes it takes people up to 10 years to get help for um, a mental health or substance abuse issue. Can you imagine that, 10 years? If you, know, if you had, um, you know, if your foot hurt or, or something, are you gonna take 10 years to, to get help? So really amazing what the impact of that time could be too. So um, employers are looking for things to do about that and an EAP could be a solution that could help. Um, the problem is you have to get people to use it. So um, when I came to Aetna about seven or so years ago, um, my background is work life. I, I think I'm the only non-clinical person who works for Aetna Behavioral Health right now. Um, and uh, so what I did is kind of take my, think about my background and those non-clinical things, all those stressors that happen to people every day, regardless of what, you know, what other medical or other kind of condition they have. And, is there a way we can leverage that and make that a way to make the EAP a lower barrier for use? So for us at Aetna, for example, we rebranded our EAP program to be called Resources for Living. We don't even, if we can get away from it, don't even use the term EAP um, and try to be very non-stigmatizing, very proactive and positive to hopefully get people in the door and maybe help them with those everyday stressors and identify when there is something else going on yeah. and, and get that assistance. Um, at the same time, it, it gives us an opportunity to talk about all those other things besides physical and mental health that go into overall, well, um, overall health of a person. Those are things like community and social and financial and um, many other things that make up a person. Um, I think finally, I'll just add to that, um, I think it's also important that a program like that can show real outcomes. So it's not just, again, utilization is always so hard for an EAP anyway, because of stigma and other reasons. So how do we really show um, that what we're doing is making a difference? And as an example, for us, we, we use some tools on the clinical side that help us show um, a change in a person's level of distress from the time they first call us to when they stop calling us. And um, over time, we can report for our, our business last year that 77% of people report an improvement in their overall well-being um, from just talking. Um, you know, at the same time, we can um, also measure self-reported uh, changes in work productivity, just again, by being connected and dealing with those overall issues that can contribute to a mental health or substance abuse um, issue that's going on. Thanks, Brooke. When we talked, you said that there's a revised definition of healthy days, which that's a term that's a way of understanding the health of a company. Um, and I thought that was an interesting concept. Could you talk a little bit about the way uh, employers might um, leverage the concept of healthy days in their own examination of their workforce? Sure, so the, the CD, CDC um, has, has this concept of healthy days to help employers develop strategies and interventions um, to basic, with the goal of increasing a healthy, a healthy days for their employees. And recently they redefined the concept to include mental health equally with physical health. So this I think is, it, it gives a, a good reason and some good timing. Um, for employers to start thinking about how they can really raise that that level, that parity, um, lowercase p, um, uh, in terms of um, um, creating that culture around um, around health, and that's more than just physical health. I thought that was really interesting, and I think it suggests that, in some ways, um, 
government, in the C in specifically in this case the CDC, follows what is a trend, a growing trend that data supports of issues with mental illness and addiction in the workplace. And so if we now have this concept of healthy days, I think that begs um, our corporations to e examine ways, identify ways that they can measure health. And I think that's where I'm going to drill down a little bit more, Brooke and Jim. One way that organizations are responding to this overarching health issue is to do a granular dive into their high cost health claims and then build a very precise employee engagement strategy to respond in a way to get those claims down. They're basically managing costs by becoming knowledgeable and informed employers. And when we think about that, that, that has layers of implications. First and foremost is that we as employers understand our health claims. We understand um, what some people call frequent flyers. Um, but more importantly, we design strategies that directly address um, how we're going to decrease claims, not, not artificially so that people don't come for help, but really increase health. Can, can Jim, you and Brooke talk to that? Sure, I, I can start. And, and I think that um, the one thing that we talked about was the fact that in many um, health claims, there's, there's also a, a comorbid um, condition. So along with a diabetes diagnosis, there's usually a mental health diagnosis in over 80% or so of those, of those claims. So um, you know, I, I kind of go back to, um, you know, that healthy days concept, the concept of well-being and, and making sure that we can, um, um, and, or an employer, can um, provide that communication and awareness around overall well-being and all those different factors that can lead to health. Um, those are ways that we can stop something that maybe is a small issue, you know, maybe a stressor that... Or, or an issue that someone might wait 10 years to get help for, um, something where we can get them help, have them recognize that something might be going on in themselves or even in others, and um, hopefully head off some uh, larger claims and costs both out of pocket for the person and for the um, employer down the road. Thank you. Jim. Well, I, um, my, my response to this is a little bit more uh, philosophical than data-driven. I think this can be a really slippery slope when you try to start looking at cost of claims, and, and it's great when it, 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 the byproduct of that analysis is well-being programs and healthy living, like you suggest. But I think too often, it's easy to take another step because it is a slippery slope, and, and, and you start looking at high costs. And any time companies start looking at high costs, they try to make things lower cost. And, and it's a very dicey area. I think this is a particular area that's very important to employees. And, and I always felt like we had to go the other way to make it more accessible so that, going back to those culture comments I made, we wanted our employees to have very, um, you know, a very easy path to addressing the problems that they needed handled. So um, we, we would do everything we could to um, create a more healthy uh, living environment for people and stop there. And in many cases, we found different coverages that we could add that were either low cost um, um, or free in some cases to, again, demonstrate that trust in the culture that we were really adamant uh, about um, living up to the responsibility that we had. And, and again, I think when that, when that happens, you get engagement. Uh, and uh, I think you just get people who care. I mean, I guess that's called engagement. But um, you know, when people start to see these signs that you don't have to advertise, they start to believe in what you're saying. And so a very slippery slope here, I think. And if Thanks, you can stop, Jim. you know, it's a, good, it's a good exercise to do. Jim, you mentioned, uh, for example, some form of a free benefit or a low-cost benefit, such as? Um, pet insurance. Pet insurance. <laughs> we offered pet insurance for people, and it didn't really cost anything for us. It was a small premium for employees. And you would think that uh, we, we cut deductibles or something. I, I couldn't believe it. It, was, it would make me laugh every year that we would offer uh, pet insurance. So. <laughs> I didn't know that. That's Healthy cool. living. You know, pets are an important part of people's Beth, lives. Beth. So Matt, thank you, Jim and Brooke. Matt, 
When we spoke, you talked about the importance of education and being open about issues, the employee, the employer creating that kind of educational open environment. So that you said, and I think by quote, when you finally realize you need help, you know what to do and where to go. And your research validates your perspective. Employee education combined with practical um, advice is essential, and that the longer that education continues and is re revitalized and energized, the more willing people are to step up and therefore not get into the um, productivity uh, dip that we've been talking about. Matt, what kind of educational programs were most impactful for you? What, what mattered to you? Yeah. Um before I address your questions, I think there's a couple of things that you should understand about this. And you folks as employers or even as individuals, if you keep in mind that you are not going to, you didn't get the employee high or drunk, right? You, you, didn't, you didn't stand there at the bar and pour, pour alcohol down their throat, right? And if you keep the same maxim that you're not going to get them sober, then, then that opens a perspective to you that it's, it's not your responsibility, per se. And, and frankly, um, this may be depressing for all of you to hear, you're not gonna do it. They have to want this. And, and that's something you have to understand. Also, so you all don't get further depressed, you should look at this and <laughs> understand that you're not in the results business. Sobriety, helping people with addiction and mental illness, if you look at this as how many people did I help today, you, you don't, you're not gonna be happy about it because all the statistics in the world will show you that, that, that the recovery rate is very low. So if you keep that in mind when, when we talk about education, you know, I think that's helpful. You know, when I, when I got sober, I, I went, to, I, I didn't have a lot of choices. I went to my bus because it was in the newspaper, okay? So, you know, it was big, not a big surprise when I walked into work that morning, um, what we were gonna talk about that day. Um, so for the average person, I think if they're sitting in front of you with this issue, you know, this is, in, in, in my opinion, a lot of this is about the individual's ability to handle pain. I'm not talking about that foot we were talking about early. How much pain is in their life? Do they want to change their life? You can't change it for them. No amount of education, the daily EAP email we get at the United States governor, government or I get at the state government, you know, telling people about their benefits and services. But having it there is what is important. So I knew when I needed to do something about it, when I wanted to do something about it, I told you about my wants. I didn't want to get sober. I just wanted to be able to walk in the front door and tell my wife, hey, I'm doing something about this. You were right, you know, or tell my parents just to get them off my back. But that doesn't matter because you're getting that education, that knowledge that there's a program out there or an outpatient service or a 12-step recovery program, whatever your, your, your method is of helping people, that they know it's there and creating that culture of openness, at, at, at least in, uh, an ability to, you know, I say open, nobody wants to talk about this stuff. You know, uh, I certainly didn't eight years ago, I can tell you that much. Um, but, it, you know, if you keep, keep in mind that this is a very personal decision, this, it doesn't get any more personal than this. And we talked about a person at work, and a per there are two different people. There's the person you are at work, and there's the person you are at home, right? And you know, no matter how comfortable or small your office is or, or how intimate it is and close you are, there's still a different person that walks through that door at night when you go home. And, and that's a decision that person has to make on their own. So ha I guess uh, to bring this full, full circle, um, keeping in mind that you didn't get anyone drunk and you're not going to get anyone sober and you're not in the results business, it's key to have that education there. Mm. You know, because when you address the problem with the employee, right, you know, here's the pamphlet, here's the booklet, but hopefully they've already seen that and they're more willing to go to it and they're more open about it, because, not open about it per se, but they're more willing to get the help because they feel secure about it. You know, Matt, um, we were talking in our Leadership Academy class this past week about the importance um, of strategic vulnerability in leadership. And that, I think it was you, Carleen, that talked about the more I'm able to strategically be vulnerable, um, the more I'm able to demonstrate how leadership is not um, necessarily this um, person that has no issues, has no problems, but it's a person who's learned to manage. And I thought that was interesting. Um, Matt, today you're in a pretty high level position. 
And I can't imagine that your journey and your experiences haven't informed how you react when people come to you. And so that would be a question I would pose. What level of um, your own life do you use to advance a person's journey towards wellness? Yeah, it's, it's interesting because um, it's a great question. Um, because for me, you know, although we're not supposed to judge anyone else, right? Um, I, I, can, I can typically spot this a little bit easier than somebody else. I mean, you've got the easy cases. You know, the, the Department of Conservation and Recreation is a, an agency of approximately 3,500 employees. Um, you know, we are, our medium salaries around uh, $42,000 a year. We're, we're an agency largely of people who are, you know, taking care of parks, plowing roadways, laying asphalt, uh, you know, lifeguards, by the way, if you, I need lifeguards. <laughs> Anyone has children or adults who want to do it too. Um, so uh, that being said, you know, it, it, there's the easy cases and the hard cases, right? So there's the guy that backs the two-ton, uh, the one-ton dump truck into the bridge abutment, and he falls, he, that you have to pour him out of the vehicle, right? So that one's easy, you know, no problem. And, and I'm deal most of these employees, 95% of them, are bargaining unit employees. So it's tough for me. Uh, to, to, you know, there's rules I have to follow. I can't sit down with the person and say, hey, look, you've got to go get help. Now, part of the bargaining unit and part of my job makes it easier because I can make some of those things mandatory for them, right? Say, you know, if it happened to work. But it's, so that's the easy stuff. You know, they were, they were caught at work using drugs or alcohol or they're suffering from, from some kind of mental issue related to that. Then I can compel them, again, not in the result business, but I know I do have faith in the services we offer at the Commonwealth, for example, if they're going to go to an outpatient or an inpatient place, I know that they're going to get in front of a professional who will at a bare minimum ruin their drinking for the rest of their life, right? <laughs> and that, that's what I'm going for. You know, so they, they'll walk out of there knowing they have a problem. They have to fix it on their own. Now, the harder issue is, is and I think probably more what you all face, is that employee who's in the office, who's kind of your pal you know, or, or who works for you, but there's that blurred line of, oh, he technically reports to me, you know, but he's late every day, his work is suffering, there's no DUIs, there's no backing a, a, a one ton into a bridge abutment, you know, there's, but there is lack of work, coming in late, flying off the handle, all the little things you notice. Again, if you go back to this being about pain, you know, individual and in your company, you know, it, things have to come to a head at some point. So, you know, oftentimes when I'm dealing with it in a situation where it's less formal and it's not a show cause hearing or uh, a union, you know, uh, run meeting about this, you know, you certainly I, you know, I'll, I'll reach across the desk and say, look, I've, I've suffered from this myself. You know, is there any chance you've got this problem? Um, but typically that's with managers, you know, that I, I have to deal Thanks, with. Thanks, Matt. Jim. I, I found it interesting that, you know, we're, we're sort of talking a lot about sort of man's um, humanity and how one creates a culture that actually um, holds a high standard of productivity, a high standard of excellence, a high standard of integrity, and within that culture of humanity um, also very much engages people in their imperfections. And you said something I thought that was very interesting. You said that we are conditioned to make it hard for people to share their imperfections, but at Easy Spirit, we're building a brand that celebrates imperfections. It is tough in all of my conversations with folks to bump into um, a CEO that I've heard say those words before, a brand that celebrates imperfections. So if you could talk about that more and correlate it to productivity, because I think in the absence of it, it sounds good, but if you could talk about it as it relates to productivity, that'd be great. Well, um, when, I, when I was introduced to the team at uh, Easy Spirit, I shared a story with them. It was the first thing I told them, which was about my experience the night before when I was packing and I wasn't in a great mood. My son came up to me and said, what's wrong? Are you, are you, uh, he said, are you, are you excited about tomorrow? How do you feel about going to your new job tomorrow? And I said, well, honestly, I'm a little bit nervous. And he said, oh, really? My son's uh, nine years old. And he said, well, daddy, you know, I was nervous on the first day of school, but it turned out okay. <laughs> 
And then, and, and he said, well, why are you nervous? He said, well, it's, you know, I said, it's a new company, a lot of things to do. There'll be some things that I haven't done before. He said, well, you know, you were at Clark's for 18 years. That, that's a long time. He said, I don't know what you did there, but there must have been some good things that you did there. So do some of those things at Easy Spirit. And I told that story before I said anything else because I, you know, at first it was important to me. I mean, the number one thing to me is my family and my children. Um, I was just showing Brooke my cell phone case here, which I always lay out in meetings, although I, I've been really engaged in this. You're doing a great job facilitating this. I mean, <laughs> but, but normally there's about 10 minutes of content and 60 minutes of a meeting, and this occupies 50 minutes, you know, and so it's a way for me to stay connected. But I had a lot of people come to me when I first got to Easy Spirit, and they were saying, you could be the brand that empowers women, and you could be the brand that gives them identity. And I'm thinking, wow, this sounds like a good idea. Let me write that one down. And, um, and you can't imagine how many people offer with great intentions, suggestions. And then I started thinking about one of my, my children, Luca, my only daughter out of four. And um, I'm thinking, well, I don't know if she needs shoes to gain her confidence or identity, and I'm thinking, and I see all this branding out that seems to be so aspirational. You know, people that, I, well, I can't speak for all of you, but I will never look like the people in the billboards and the magazines. And I thought, wouldn't it be cool if we could just say, hey, that's not life. Let's look at the way people really um, conduct themselves. Let's celebrate all types of women, ages, shapes, sizes, colors. And, and instead of focusing on something that doesn't exist, like the first graphic I saw at Easy Spirit was two, and we're a women's only brand, so that's why I'm, I'm focusing on the women's discussion. I, I saw two women incredibly made up on a picnic uh, blanket that was checkered with a picnic basket and two really beautiful kids that probably weren't even related to them. And I thought, that's just not how people live. And, then, and I was really inspired by the idea to make the brand more accessible for real people, and real people have imperfections. All of us do, and um, and and I think, you know, having a brand that recognizes that, and having a brand that says we want broad appeal, is something that is uh, mission worthy. I think people people then start to again trust what you're saying, you know, because the trust I talked about not only works with employees, it works with consumers, it works with suppliers, it works with people in your family, it works with your neighbor, and. I think that anything we can do, anytime you're building a relationship, to be honest, which is, you know, what I'm talking about is just being more honest about who we are and say, we're not going to give you confidence, identity, but we might make your feet a little more comfortable and that might help you be a better version of yourself, whatever that version is, and that's up to you. And so that's where that came I from. I see. Thanks. My Thanks. daughter, Luca. <laughs> I love it. <clears throat> I have easy spirit shoes on right now. I can confess to that. You know, the, wait till you see the fall line. <laughs> so, coming to stores near you in June. So, Brooke, I want to go back to what both Matt and Jim have talked about, um, this concept of not just culture and education, but um, there is a body of research that suggests that one of the most powerful ways in which to influence a person's journey or life toward recovery is peer-to-peer -peer work. Here I am, I'm an individual that might need help, and here I am, an individual that's been there, as mad as you were talking about. And so um, I, I love that idea, and I dug more into it, and I found that a lot of EAP programs are promoting that, except that they're struggling with the concept of HIPAA and confidentiality. How do I break through that confidentiality uh, umbrella if I really want to create a peer-to-peer -peer environment in the workplace? Can you talk to that? Sure. So um, at a basic level, we can help, an EAP can help to connect um, individuals with th those different supports, you know, support groups, recovery groups, um, even peer-to-peer -peer coaching types of relationships. And we're seeing more and more of um, that in a more structured way. So whether it's through social media connections or other ways, it's um, definitely something out there. But, you know, I I would say, Lori, that um, one of the, the keys for the workplace is in how we're engaging managers. And, and I think Matt and Jim really hit on this today. And 
um, this stuff isn't easy, you know, for, for our managers, particularly, Matt, and you're, when you're talked about being a friend yeah. with an employee, yeah. you know, and, and I think it's really important for managers to have access to um, some specialized support to help them figure out the right thing to do within the workplace walls, because that's totally different than being out there in the world. And um, so there are programs that can help, and, and I'll bring this back to peer-to-peer, -to -peer, yeah. in the workplace. You know, things like you, you had mentioned earlier, our work with Campaign to Change Direction. That's a, it's a group out of Washington. All it does, uh, it, it's basically a communications campaign that um, says, hey, here are some signs that someone might be suffering emotionally. If you see that, how about reach out and see how are you doing? It's about being human, that's it. And so, um, you know, by making those kinds of connections too in the workforce and allowing ourselves to be human with each other, you know, you still need the infrastructure, you still need some policies and, and procedures and programs and things like that to help you. But, you know, it seems like that's a way we could try to, um, you know, still maintain confidentiality, you know, and um, particularly if you're working with that specialized support um, group that, that um, can help a manager work through these issues, they're going to help you do that in the most respectful way, um, you know, for you and for the employee who you're dealing I, with. I think you also talked about mental health first aid. Yeah. How does that fit in? Yeah, so um, actually mental health first aid is, um, now has a corporate program um, that um, is, it kind of goes beyond the campaign to change direction. Yeah. It's a, it's a full kind of like CPR first aid training. It's an eight hour program that teaches people how to um, recognize and respond appropriately when a mental health situation is happening. Um, and then what to do until the situation either passes or until help gets there. And so programs like that can help to really change the culture um, at an organization um, to make people just more open to um, noticing these things. And you know what, I, I think of it like, um, heart disease or cancer many decades ago, those things were stigmatized. No one talked about them. Today, I'll bet everyone in this room can tell me one symptom of a heart attack. Yeah. That's where we are right now with mental health and substance abuse. Yeah. We've got to get it started and, and try to change that Great. conversation. Great, thank you. I have a couple more questions to ask the panel, but I want to just stop and see if we could um, maybe elicit some questions from all of you. Any questions that you'd like to ask the panel at this time? I have a question in the back. Do we have our microphone runner? Great, thank you. Hello, good morning everyone. I'm Tammy Perry. I'm a case manager for FedCap uh, with the We Care program. I do have a specific question to the panel. I want to talk about employee buy-in. So you talked about a lot of the resources that you have for your employees, but how do you get the employees engaged? How do you get the, the, the word out about the EAP program? I think you call it a resource for life. And how do you get them to really embrace the concepts or the initiatives that you created with your, uh, in your particular programs or companies? I think any one of you could answer that, yeah. From, well, frankly for me, so I'm a, a lifelong bureaucrat. Um, so don't throw anything at You're me, please. You're a pretty cool person. Yeah. For Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, so the government um, has great uh, way of handling this. They make it a requirement. So, you know, we, you have to go through EAP training. You have to sit through, uh, you know, sem ad nauseum seminars and, you know, uh, take a test, frankly, at the end. You know, if you have this problem, where do you go? You know, they're all in line. So, for us, I think in the, at least, in, and I know, you know, having served in both the federal and, and state government, um, the education portion of this um, is, is easy because they, they know where it is and they know how to get there because they have to take a yearly training. So if you can afford that or do that or it's practical in the private sector, uh, I would I would do that. You know, make it part of of an employee's onboarding package, and maybe have a yearly or bi-yearly refresher that's mandatory for them to take. Um, we have a monthly email that comes out um, from the uh, EAP program. You know, that talks about different programs and things like that. Again, if you go back to my maxim of you are not going to get anyone sober and you're not going to get anyone drunk. All right, you you in in this you know you're not in the results business. They just need to know it's there. And when you address the problem, you know where you're going to send them, right? Or they're going to, you know, but they need to know it's there. So I think that's the best way. I think the other piece is that you need to make it relevant for the individual who I'll call the consumer. 
You know, if I like blue shoes, I'm not going to look at the flyer that has yellow ones on it. So um, I, I <laughs> we don't have your well, size. Well, that's right. That's another ones. good point. <laughs> so um, I, you know, I think marketing and communications have to really be specific, and you got to you, you have to think of the ways that, or think of who you're talking to, and the ways that's going to inspire somebody to say, "Hey, oh, that's how somebody used that service." Don't just list all the bullets of yeah. what we do, but how do you create a story um, around Great. what it is that we do? Great, yeah. thanks. Jim? I, you know, I, um, I will say, Matt, some days I wish I could just make people do things, um, and, you know, but we don't have a bureaucracy. And, uh, but, but I think that, uh, again, going back to the environment you have, and, and we didn't really talk about values, but um, it's very important for me to uh, uh, see an organization where people understand that we care about each other. And, and we talk about the programs and we make them accessible, but, but it's also good when you have a, a culture and people feel comfortable with vulnerability, sometimes they share their success stories and that helps too when, uh, when, when people can talk amongst themselves. So going back to something you were just talking about with laws and confidentiality, you know, I, and I'm, I'm very much in favor of having policies in place, but also don't don't underestimate your instinct. This is a little bit like jazz music when you're dealing with people. There's no, there isn't music always in front of you. And I happen to be a drummer, so I grew up playing music. And so the analogy works for me, or the metaphor, where you, know, you just have to trust your instincts sometimes. And you have to use the art of dealing with people and know when the right time is to bring things up and talk about things and ask somebody whether or not they might share to benefit one of the people they work with their stories about these mm. programs. Thanks, Jim. Thank you. Thank you, all of you. You're welcome. Other questions people might have? I had a question, Jim, that I wanted to ask you specifically, and it had to do with um, the hiring process. Um, so you've been talking about creating this culture, and one of the things that I read is um, that, and it makes sense, of course, that the CEO is probably the most influential person in creating an environment of trust and a focus on well-being. And I think that's true, and I think, you know, at FedCap we certainly experience that. How you then went on to talk in our conversation about you said, I would be surprised sometimes at the people that you hire, that they might not fit into what somebody else might think is this perfect employee, but they work within your culture. And I think that's important because I think it addresses the way in which people are, um, are willing to come forward and talk about issues that are impacting productivity. Yeah. Well, I think I referred to the hiring process a little bit, uh, well, a few minutes ago, where it's just an enormous responsibility. And I, and I always kind of, again, compare it to real life, where we're going to look across the dance floor for quite a while before we actually dance together. And before that slow dance and before we get married, there's a long process of getting to know people because it's an enormous responsibility. And I, and I, don't, I don't believe in the typical discussion in an inter interview, which I give you 45 minutes to tell me everything I need to know about you to make a good hire decision, I think that's a little upside down. So I do a lot of talking, if you can imagine that, in an interview to describe the environment because what I say at the end is that the decision ultimately, you get to a point where you know you have a favored candidate in the process. And once somebody gets to me, I don't let them talk at all. I give them the environment that they're coming into and I, you know, I, I impress upon them that ultimately it's going to be your decision. And if you're trying to get a job, this is probably not the place for you. But if you want to develop and have a, a, a real experience, then consider this an environment, with, with an environment where you might or might not succeed. You have to decide that. Because in six months from now, we'll all figure it out. But those first few six months, we might not know. So, so you know, I try to get people to be very careful about the decision both ways. And, and again, I don't get, you know, fortunately for me, I've had enough experience now, and it, and it came late in life um, as a result of getting involved with an organization called Triangle up in Malden, Massachusetts that helps people with disabilities. Um, and, and from that experience, I stopped looking at the obvious, or said another way, I look beyond the obvious. Yeah. And, and that was a gift somebody gave me, and it helps to, again, focus less on differences and more on similarities. Wow. And it, I would actually um, be remiss if I didn't say, does it work? I mean, 
does it impact productivity? I, you know, I, I think a great, another metaphor, it's like an Italian sauce. I mean, you take the ingredients out and they're not always great on their own, but when you put it all together, it seems to work. I mean, all these things have great commercial results, but I think when you treat people the right way, great things happen. We don't manage to be profitable. We manage to help people be successful. I agree with what you said. I think what you were getting at, too, is, is, is something I really believe in. I don't focus on the re results because I can't control the result. I can control the effort. I can control the input. But I can't control the result. And when you bring all these things together, I can point to success stories that we've had. Um, I grew up with a, a father who's brought baseball teams to championship uh, games just about every season, no matter who they tried to put in his lineup. And, and in, in the Clark story, we took a company from a break-even to about $100 million in profit. And I think certainly the way we treated people was probably the most important part of that success story. Thanks. Can you join me in, yes, appreciating and thanking our panel? Excellent. I learned so much from each of you every time you opened your mouth, and I really, really appreciate your willingness to be here with us today. Thank you so much. And now I would like to introduce Joe Gianetto, our Chief Operating Officer and a dear colleague. Thank you, Lori. Hope this is on. Hey, on behalf of everyone at the agency, including all of our board members, um, we would like to thank our distinguished panelists for their participation their insightful and enlightening commentary. Thank you very much. And I want to acknowledge the great work that was done by Lori Lutz and her entire engagement team for putting this event together and moderating the discussion. Thank you, Lori. And, I, and we all want to thank all of you for joining us today in this beautiful spring day. Um, speaking of spring, it happens to be one of my favorite seasons. It's a time of renewal, a time of hope for better things to come. And in many ways, what we learned today is that the topics of mental health and addiction and society's perspective are undergoing a transformation and a renewal. Today's discussion and the related literature, by the way, creates a hopeful atmosphere that society's approach to mental health and addiction services um, are changing for the betterment of everyone. You know, speaking of the literature, I was reading the booklet that many of you have today. And um, I was particularly interested in the fold-out that's in the middle of the book. It's primarily a timeline uh, that depicts the evolution of U.S. policy on this subject matter. But it starts out with a period called ancient times. I'm going to digress for a second because I have two young children, and every time I speak to them about my childhood, they call that period ancient times, by the way. <laughs> Jim, I try to say to them that, you know, we didn't have cell phones when we were kids growing up. And they said, Dad, because you didn't have anything in ancient times. What are you talking about? <laughs> anyway, from ancient times, by the way, when society viewed mental illness as some sort of form of demonic possession, um, to today, obviously, the mental health and addiction landscape has changed drastically. But as we heard today, I think we're on the cusp of another exponential shift in society's approach to servicing the needs of people with mental illness and, and addiction. Um, so as we close out the program, I just, uh, it's worth noting that FedCAP's approach to the delivery of mental health and addiction services is from a workforce development lens uh, with a focus on economic well-being and long-term self-sufficiency. I think Craig said it earlier when he mentioned that we believe that work completes treatment. And I think, Jim, you alluded to this in your comments when you said that, my words, paraphrasing, employment not only provides a paycheck, but also a sense of purpose, opportunities to learn, and a chance to work with others. And most importantly, work offers hope, and hope is vital to recovery. So I'm going to end on that note, and uh, more information on today's event can be found on our website. And again, I want to thank you all for coming. Have a great day.